One of my disappointments this past, past season was I kind of ran out of time and I didn't get to finish processing this portion of a tree I was working on. These should already be bowl blanks, box blanks, sitting in the kiln, drying, so that come this next season I would have stuff to make for markets and stuff like that. Because it's waited those two seasons, even though I painted ends and stuff like that, quite a few of these are now trash. Uh, now, I'm not going to call them trash because I'm experimenting and trying to learn and become a better spoon carver. So those cracks that have developed in these, they go with the grain. So I will be able to use those because it's nice green wood still uh, to play around with making spoons. But they won't be the bowls I originally started them out to be. Now, this week my main goal, one of my main goals is to get these processed and drying. Now, I've already made quite a few videos on roughing out wooden bowls. One I call the Roughing Life. Another video I went from a tree to a finished bowl in one day. Both of those are online and have been quite popular. I've also done two videos on how to core bowl blanks. So you can get multiple bowl blanks out of a single hunk of wood. One was on the one-way easy coring system, and the other was on the McNaughton system. And once again, I've got a lot of response of people that learn quite a bit from those. But it doesn't make sense to rehash those over and over and over. So for this week's video, I'm going to dive deep into a few aspects of bowl turning so that those of y'all that are getting started can kind of understand my logic and why we do certain things a certain way. And I'll give you several options there. This is not going to be a uh, chronological video. I'm going to be popping in and out of working all these different things just so that we can focus the discussion on specific aspects. And I'll go through a few of those. So, let's get busy and start making a mess. Okay, the first thing I want to talk about is grain orientation and movement. And yes, this is going way back to the basics, but it's the first thing you need to take in consideration when you're out with a fallen tree or you're cutting one down. You're actually starting with the chainsaw. And then once you get it back into your shop, how you want to get the bowl out of what you've chainsawed out. It starts at the very beginning. So, you look at a tree. In an ideal situation, you have a perfectly round log and the pith is in the middle. Okay, and then you can take out that pith with two chainsaw cuts. A lot of people will make two more chainsaw cuts to get rid of the bark and get a nice flat parallel section right there. That is an ideal situation. This also does lead you to other sides and that becomes your first piece of firewood. These you can use for other things. But a nice perfect log will give you two sections that will become great bowls. That's in an ideal situation. Very rarely does that ever happen. Most of the time we are having to scavenge and find whatever we can. And a tree with a pith in the dead center with perfectly straight grain, you can find that kind of tree if it grew up in a forest where the tree was actually reaching up for the sky within a big canopy. But if you're like me, you're just kind of scavenging stuff wherever you can find it. And a lot of times that's stuff that falls down over in somebody's yard or it's from a construction site. It's not really old growth. It's early growth that just falls over quickly. Uh, and those are not ideal situations because the trees are not only leaning because they're going for the uh, sun from, on the side of a field or... Uh, for whatever reason, they are not. They don't grow up nice and tall and straight. They might spread out quite a bit because if they don't have a lot of competition for sunlight, that's what trees do. So very rarely are you going to have a pith in the dead center. More than likely, it's going to be off to the side a little bit somewhere, and your growth rings are going to be very tight on one side and wide on the other. This is also really common if you use branch wood. And I don't like using branch wood because a lot of my stuff is furniture and you get a lot of reaction wood in branches and stuff like that. There's a lot of tension holding up all that weight. But for bowls or green uh, spoon carving and stuff like that, branch wood is just fine. 
But either way, you look at that. How are you going to cut this out? Well, the idea is you want to balance the grain. So I come over here and I might take a straight edge. And obviously, if I do that right there, cut it off just like I did the uh, earlier one, get rid of the pith, the grain's wide over here but narrow over here. It's never going to be a balanced bowl. So I have to actually balance my cut to the best I can. And a lot of times, it's just kind of finding what whatever you can do and make my cuts like that. And then another one right here. That's pretty much going to be either a platter or just trash or maybe I don't even make that cut and I just cut it out here and hope to get maybe a vase plank over there. But however I do it, I've now got as balanced a grain pattern as I can get on my blank. And a lot of times when this kind of situation happens, I'm going to make a cut right in the middle then maybe cut off the end and get two bowl blanks from one side of the tree and not nothing on the other side of the tree. It's just how the pith is within the blank. You want to bounce it out straight from the chainsaw. So back to that perfect scenario where the pith was in the dead center of the tree and we cut out the pith. And I'm going to be discussing just a traditional bowl, not a natural edge bowl at this particular time. We'll come back to the natural edge in a second. And then we'll go get it to practical demonstrations after I do the board work. But in this kind of situation, I would typically cut off both ends like that so that I end up with two blanks kind of like this. Now, you have an option here of how you want to put this blank on the lathe. Do you want the top of the bowl to be up here? Oops. Or do you want the top of the bowl to be closer to the pith? This is more traditional because you can get a bigger bowl out of a certain size blank when you do it that way. It does tend to get wet, rid of more of the sapwood at the same time. Whereas this design right here, you end up keeping a little bit of the sapwood as decorations on those corners. Okay, But you can see just in my diagram that this is a lot bigger a bowl. Now, here's the thing. After you rough it out, you're going to, we're going to talk about that in a second, how thick to make it and stuff like that. And you set it aside to dry. How it's going to dry depends upon these two designs. Typically, when wood dries, the grains want to straighten out because the leg growth, the darker section of the grain, has less water in it. And when these start to shrink, the early growth, they just kind of stretch everything out. So in this design right here, what you end up with is as these straighten out, you get a high spot in the middle. And it will elongate out more like a football as it dries, okay? Whereas this one right here, the outsides are going to come up a little bit. But the main thing is, this section right here is not going to move as much in this design as in this design, okay? So, if you're making a, a green bowl and you're going to just finish turn it, a lot of times, a few months after you turn it, all you have to do is re-sand down this bottom section and you will have a lot less work to do and it will sit flat on your table. Whereas this kind right here, it kind of, more movement is happening right there so you're going to have to remove more of it up here and more of it over here in order to get that nice flat bolt. So working with a chainsaw is basically half of the aspect of dealing with grain orientation and movement. Let's get it ready for the lathe. So when I do the chain work, saw work, as I said, I like to balance the green as best I can, getting the pith in the center, but that's not always possible. And I also like to leave them a little bit longer so that if they do crack before I can get to them, I still have a little meat in here. Now I have two trash can lids that I've collected over the years and they are perfect for my size lathe. This larger one right here just barely fits 
above the rail. So I can use this to determine my maximum size I can actually fit on my lathe. But a lot of times I use smaller stuff, so that's where the smaller bowl of uh, trash can comes in. And really, this is about as small as I want to go with a bowl for profitability purposes. So, on this one right here, I've got some cracking coming in from either side. So I'm going to go a little bit larger than this right here to get my maximum size. Now the pit of this particular tree is kind of hard to see because I colored it in white. But you can tell where the crack is, and the crack generally comes out of the pith. And I always like to use some kind of colored chalk uh, on these because it's just easier to see. So the pith of my tree is right there, and I've got a crack about right there. So if I come up, I've got the pith coming about right here as the center of the tree. And on the back side, it's about right there. So if I line this up, Hopefully that is the center of my tree. So now I can take my circle thing and kind of center it to give me the most centered tree. And as you can see, I did not do as good a job as I possibly could with a chainsaw because it is off-centered or this tree just grew sec uh, differently. But on every one I bring up here, it's going to be slightly different. So this is going to be the bowl I get. So I come over and I would just draw a circle maybe an inch on the outside of this section. Doesn't have to be perfect now. And then I'll take that to the bandsaw and bandsaw it out. Now here's another one, but on this one I'm going to try and keep a natural edge, but I know I'm not going to be able to keep the bark on this one because I've waited too long. The bark is already kind of flexing off, so it's probably going to be flying off. But I'm looking at this one right here. I have more meat on my bowl right there but my pith is right there. So what do I want to do? Do I want to have a balanced bowl or do I want to affect the shape of the bowl? Maybe so it dips a little bit in front or, these, or the sides. So here we go. I have my pith right here coming up, but the meat of the bowl is more on this side right there. So here's where I have the decision to make. If I line up the center of the grain, the grain on the inside of the bowl will be matched up, but it will be a little bit weighted one side or the other. And for this particular application, I think that would be kind of cool looking, so that's what I'm going to go for. So then I just need to figure out how far in the cracks come and go from there. But you notice I am not centered on the log. I am centered on the pit. So, I have a bit of a challenge right here. Notice I have two pits, one right there and one right there. On this side, I have a pit right here. Now, this is mesquite. It doesn't move that much. So, for the few weeks I had this in this log form, I left the pit in. Normally, I would cut it out. But the thing is, you can tell this is a crotch piece of wood. So, right about here, in between these two pits is going to be some really cool feathering. And I want to see if I can capture that in the bottom of a bowl. So by leaving the pit here, I have a place for the tenon, and the bottom of the bowl will be as close to that feathering as possible. And I want to center that feathering inside the bowl. So what I have to do is I have to come up and align the pith right here. And I've done the same thing to the other side. I've lined the pith up right there. I balanced the grain as easily, evenly as I possibly could right there. But when I balance the grain that way, if you notice that these two are kind of off-center, which means that feathering would be off-center. So I've got to make a decision. Do I go for the larger bowl that's still going to have a flame in it, but it's going to be slightly off-center, or do I go for a slightly smaller bowl where I can get that feathering more in the middle? I'm actually going to choose to go for the smaller bowl and try to line these up as evenly as possible on either side. So there we go. 
This is the circle I'm going to go for instead of the full size. So the question becomes, would you have made the same decision? Smaller or bigger? Now in this particular bowl blank, the center of the tree was right about there. So all the cracks are emanating from there. So I do have a lot of cracks coming in through here and I have one coming up all the way here. Now these bottom ones I can tell go all the way through because I can see the crack coming all the way through. So on this particular one, I'm going to want to make this the bottom of the bowl because it's going to be in a chuck and it's going to be squeezing together and I will probably lose a good portion of this log to just waste but I might be able to get something you know four inches deep by coming from the top so on this particular one while I'm loading it up the orientation was dictated by the cracks but that doesn't mean I still can't balance it once it's on the lathe so let's put it between centers first because that's the way I like to start So we got it somewhat round now, but this is the kind of situation where you're, you're constantly analyzing it. This one might actually be trash. Because I come over here and I look at these right here, and you think, well, I've got two cracks that are coming from the outside of the tree going in, and I don't really have anything in the pith. So I might be able to bring this all the way back. But you keep coming around, and on this side, I have cracks coming in from the pith and from the outside. Which means at this point in time, the only thing that's good about this blank is about these two inches right here. Now I'm going to try and go in a little bit more because I know that these cracks are coming up quite a bit and they're all the way through. But I don't know how deep this one is. And a lot of times these might just turn into trash and I would have been better off making this into a spoon. So I'll go in another inch or maybe two and then I'll decide and we'll come back from there. So now looking at that, these cracks are getting a little bit smaller. I imagine if I went through another inch, I, I would probably be gone. But once you get past this time, it's not really worth a lot of effort in my part because of what I know I can make on it. But if I come down to the crack at this point right here, and then this bottom cracks end up right there, that right there is pretty much a two to one ratio so that would be a nice looking bowl so my my goal right now is to bring these in and put a tenon on this side in the trash wood to make the nice side joke bowl before i do that one i want to start balancing the grain so i'm looking at this right here and i can see where the center of the grain is but i notice i'm getting a different shape right there so I could probably pivot this one way or the other to more balance the grain but what I want you to really pay attention to is where the curves of the grain are finding their halfway point and if you notice I line them up the top of the it's right here this top that pretty much forms a straight line through the the block the same for the other side now you might get one perfect the other could be off. You want to focus on both the concave and the convex curves to make sure that they line up going through the center of the bowl. If they aren't, this is the time I should pivot it one way or the other. I did a pretty good job with the chainsaw and the bandsaw on this one, so it's okay. I'm not, I don't need to pivot it, but hopefully in a second we'll get one that's off. 
Now there will be times that you end up for whatever reason with a bowl blank that is not optically cut. This particular example came out of a much larger bowl blank but that developed a crack down the center. So instead of just trashing it, I split a large blank into four smaller blanks with the idea that I would be getting a bowl that I'm not going to be putting in an art gallery. This is going to be a lesser, visually lesser quality bowl, but it's still going to be a nice functional bowl that I could sell at a farmer's market or something like that. But even in these situations, I want to at least practice getting the best I can. Now, I have, the hard side is fairly nice on this blank, but I have developed this crack coming up here that's fairly deep here, but it tapers off right here. And I notice that the grain the heart grain is somewhat over here. So if I were to, re instead of taking the full width of this one, if I were to relocate it a little bit smaller and over to this side, using this portion that has a crack in it as a tenon that holds a bowl on the chuck, there is a chance that I can get mainly the heart wood in the bowl with just the slightest amount of sap wood at the bottom. It's a risk, but sometimes it's good exercise just to try the best you can to get the best results. So this one I did do not do that great with a chainsaw. Uh, it is not balanced as far as the grain direction here because you can see by the point of where these are, it's not quite on the center of the grain. But this is going to be a natural edge bowl, so I'm really I'm going to put a priority on balancing the rim of this than the grain. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to take the high spot of the sap on this side, the high spot on the sap on that side, I'm going to try and get it somewhat parallel to my chuck. And this one right here, I can bring this over that way a little bit. So it's just a matter of loosening the tailstock and lowering it down you know, a quarter of an inch at a time. Then I'll do the same exact thing to the bottom of the sapwood here and the bottom of the sapwood there. And by putting my fingers on it, I can kind of stand back and examine it. It makes it a lot easier to do that. So I have a mesquite bowl here and it wasn't balanced as far as the center of the grain. You can tell this pith is right here and right there and is decidedly off from the center of the of the spindle. So in order to make this look somewhat decently I shifted my pattern more to trying to get the rim to bounce out because I have two low spots and two high spots so if I can get them roughly set at the same spot at least the rim will be in the same spot. You do the best you can with the bowl that's in front of you. Okay, we've got it grain balanced. We have a somewhat nice shape on the outside. So now we need to make two decisions. Are we going to rough it out and let it dry so that we can twice turn it to make the shape just perfect? Or are we going to turn it green to its final shape, let it dry for a week or two, and then put it right on the market? Now. Me personally, I'm looking at this bowl right here. It doesn't have too much figure. It doesn't have any really spalting or anything like that. And personally, that's kind of my favorite shape because the wood is very homogeneous. So to make it an attractive bowl, it all comes down onto my skill, my design. So I am going to rough this out and let it dry so that I can come back and make it perfect in my eyes on the lathe. If you had some figure to it that would draw a lot of attention, I might consider turning it green to the final shape, setting it aside for a week or two, and then just putting it on the market. Because in that kind of situation, people are buying the figure in the wood and not necessarily the shape of the bowl. Right? That's somewhat secondary. The other decision we need to make is what are we going to do with this interior? Now, if this was a tad bit bigger, I might pull out my hollowing system and scoop out these interiors to make two more bowls. This is just big enough that I might get a small bowl out of it and setting everything aside, setting up my jig just to get a salsa dip bowl, it's not really worth it for me, I, I, my opinion. 
So I'm just going to turn this intersection into mulch. So I had this bowl, it's about the size of my hand, so a good single serving salad bowl or oatmeal bowl, but it is not balanced. So this is definitely not going to go to an art market, it's going to go to a farmer's market uh, because it's going to be a utilitarian bowl. So the question is, do I just finish turn it now and put it and sell it, or do I rough turn it, set aside, and maybe add a little decoration to it? One factor made that decision for me. I have what looks like a tiny wormhole right here. It's completely filled. It might be that that worm just kind of skimmed the surface and backed out because it is right on the heartwood and uh, the transition of the heartwood and worms don't tend to like heartwood. They prefer to stay in the sapwood. So that's what I think's happened, but there's a risk that the worm went into the center part. Nobody's going to buy a utilitarian bowl with a hole in it. You can't put soup or oatmeal or anything in, in like that. So there's a chance that this might be just decorative. So I'm going to go ahead and finish turn it because I don't want to waste my time on the risk. Especially at this price point. Now here's a situation where I have a really nicely spalted bowl. So it is worth my effort to uh, try to save as much of it as possible. So I am going to attempt to core it out. But if you notice, at the 9 inch part, that does not leave me my 10% wall thickness for this to dry properly. So there are situations where I might just scoop out a little bit so I can move the center point of my arc to come out a little bit and just scoop the top out to not go fully deeply in order to save as much of the money bowl as possible. Now in this particular situation, I do have some cracks I see starting here and there, right at the pith. So I know they're, cr and I can see cracks running right here. But I don't think they go very deep. So I'm going to risk not turning off this cracked area at first and scoop out the interior to see how I can maximize that interior cut. Now, if I only get a bowl that's two inches thick, it'll at least make a very nice looking uh, platter, small dish or something like that that somebody could put by the front door that throw their keys on or keep nuts on their counter or something like that because the coloration is just pretty so it's worth at least attempting to save as much as you can. Hide armor that are patched together open into it like a decoration to make it look uh, extremely intimidating. Beams of, of burning arcane energy as they hit an impact you watch the flames kind of curl up and has to like pat it out with its giant hand. So here's an example of a bowl that would be perfect for hollowing out. It is roughly 12 inches across. So the, we need to decide where we're going to start with this one. An easy way to do that one is just pick up your hollowing jig. I am using a one-way sip, their easy core. And basically it has a pivot point and this arm reaches around. So I can come in here and put my pivot point right in the center. And I know it's right here and now. I am the, the cutting edge is actually reaching all the way to the tenon. So in order for me to do the, use this size, I would have to come in right there. And that would give me an extremely shallow bowl. And then it would make this a little bit too thin. So I know I can't use this size. My 9 inch size though, I put the center portion here and if I bring it out to the back that leaves me maybe an inch and a half on bottom, perfect size, and it will give me a nice shape to the cutout. It will not make, take advantage of the entire width that I can use. So I will have to come off a little bit more after the fact, but this will give me a nicely shaped core blank coming out. Now you can core natural edge bowls. There are techniques to doing it. But you have a decision. Is it going to be worth it? 
Now this particular bowl, I've been looking at the bark and I don't think I'm going to be able to keep it. I, it's probably going to fly off one portion of this circle and if that happens, I go ahead and take all the bark off. I'll leave the cambium layer, but remove the bark. But that would kind of decrease its uh, commercial, its sale ability at a higher price. For some reason, if you can maintain this bark, customers, they pay more for it. And it might only be 20 bucks, but that 20 bucks could offset your decision on whether or not to core it out. Because if you do core it out, this is a scraping cut. It's not a slicing cut. You're almost guaranteed to lose the bark in that situation. Well, because I don't have any faith that's going to do it, it seems worthwhile to me to go ahead and get this center core section. And even though it's not a very big bowl and I'm only going to be able to get the smallest core, because it's a natural edge and I'm going to turn that core green, so I'm not going to have that much time involved in it, it seems worthwhile to pull out the coring setup and spend the time to get that center section out. If this was a regular twice turn bowl and I was just getting that center core section, I probably wouldn't spend the time. I would just turn it into shavings because I can do that one in just a few minutes. One of the things you can do to slow down your drying, if for some reason you had to leave it, you go out for lunch or dinner or overnight, is throw a bag over it. To see how well this works, I actually got distracted and this bowl has had a bag over it for almost six days. So let's see how badly it's dried or warped. Okay, fairly thick. I'm looking around the edges. Has not cracked at all. Whereas other logs I cut over there and put down that didn't have anything on them, they have cracked. So it's a pretty good way to, I don't know if it's the reduction of the airflow over the wood or it's bringing uh, moisture together because I could not seal the backside that's in the chuck with this thing right here. I think it's just a d d reduction of airflow that does the work. But that's a temporary way you can slow down the drying process if you need to. Now the drying process is happening all the time. In fact, a lot of times it's happening right on the lathe and when you turn natural edge stuff where you're going really thin, it'll start to warp on the outside before you finish doing the inside. So it's incredibly important if you're batching stuff out like I'm about to do today where I'm going to do six or seven of these bowl blanks and a lot of times there's enough room that I can get a core out of it. But I don't want to be changing my chuck around a whole bunch. So in between stages where I'll do all the roughing, then the coring, then removing the tenons on the stuff I'm turning green, I will throw them all into the same large plastic bag. That way, the moisture that they do expel will kind of feed the interior of the bag. You know, keep everything moist and it won't warp as much. But this is only some of the stuff I do if I'm going to return it or go to the second stage the same day. Now this is one of those situations will make you cry because we've got a nicely sized bowl right here, but I do have some cracks coming into it. Some natural cracks and you kind of have to expect that a lot of times. The pith of this tree was right about there, so losing about that much of the tree, that, that should have been expected. But this one had some nice spalting, so I wanted to see how much I could keep. And I hollowed this one out, and this one didn't have that much cracks in it, so that's going to be a nice bowl. But I'm going to go ahead and waste away all the way down to my finger to get to solid wood. Because at this stage, right before you're drying, you want to get to absolutely no cracks whatsoever no matter how much material you remove because you will end up with a better bowl. Any hairline cracks or something like that are just going to get magnified and could completely blow up the bowl blank as it dries making it worthless. It's better to get a nicely colored, nicely shaped, smaller bowl than risk losing everything. Now here I got a green turn bowl. And what I like to do is right off the lathe, right when it's finished, I go ahead and put a good coat of oil on it and I will let that set for a few hours. And if it is a 
no, just a green turn board and not a natural edge, I would then go ahead and coat it in wax before I put it in the kiln to finish drying. The reason why this green turn bowl that I just took off was actually warping while I was cutting it. So much moisture is leaving it because you're getting it fairly thin so the moisture doesn't have to go very far. You need something to fill that. Uh, it's not the internal moisture that's leaving, it's the external moisture. You need something to fill that gap, that moisture content, I mean that, that dryness, and the oil does it and it will really soak it up. Now some people will do an oil wax mixture which is perfectly fine. It basically does the same thing I'm doing in two steps they do it in one. I just don't, I don't, I just soak in the oil first and put the wax on the outside. So all I'm doing right now is just really giving a good bath of oil. I will then put it in the kiln after that soaks in and in a day or two I'll re-sand it and put wax on it. And that's the drying process I use for green turn stuff. So here's an example of a bowl that I'm going to turn green. I've finished the outside, sanded as much as I'm going to do. This is going to be a farmer's market bowl. So at this point in time, I'm going to oil the outside of it, and then I'm going to put beeswax on it. And these two will kind of mix to form a, a slurry finish, and that finish will slow down the drying process a little bit, so maybe it won't warp that much. And then I'm going to turn out the inside, make it very, very thin, and apply the oil and wax finish there. The oil will fill any gaps in moisture in the outside of the cell, and hopefully the wax will seal in the inside of the cell just to slow the drying process down, and you'll be ready to sell in about a week. Now, when I am roughing out a lot of bowls uh, to put in the kiln, you know, you do them about 10%, but if you're doing them a whole bunch, you don't want to break every single time to put wax or paint on them. So what I do is I have these shavings right down here. They're nice and green shavings. I'll just continuously drop them over and cover them up with the shavings that just came out of them. And I can do that one for several days and they will stay nice and moist until I have a whole bunch of them uh, to all paint at once. And it's just a quick and easy way to do it. Another way is to stick them all in a cardboard box. The cardboard box will prevent air movement and it'll keep a little bit of moisture in there, uh, but it will allow some moisture to escape through the cardboard. The cardboard will absorb it, then it'll go into the air. I just found this works really well for me. And yeah, you end up with a pile of shavings right here with maybe 40 bowls in there. But hey, kind of dig it through, it's half the fun. Now, on the flip side, if you don't want to leave them in the shavings, another option is I have, I drink a lot of lemonade. And they come in these little containers, but you can find a lot of products that come in containers. I simply cut a little slot on the top of one of them, and I can keep a brush in there. And because there's no air movement, that brush stays pretty wet. And then you can just paint the ends uh, and put them in your kiln or wherever you want to dry them. Now I will say this, I used to advocate using latex paint but it, because it's fairly cheap and I bought the off colors and it will work. But it doesn't work as well as wax or anchor seal which is a, somewhat of a wax. And get the original stuff if you get it yet. It's not that much more than a gallon of paint but it does tend to go farther and it just works better. I don't, rarely do I get failure with anchor seal, but I sometimes do with oil-based paints. Uh, I'm sorry, I said latex earlier, I meant oil-based. And the idea with whatever you use is you want to prevent rapid moisture loss. You do want to get the moisture out, but you don't want it to go too far out. So if you look right here, the grain is running this way in this bowl. So this right here is all in grain. And in grain is like a bunch of straws, and the moisture just leaves that area a lot quicker than it does a long grain. So if we can plug up the holes of the end grain, it'll dry a lot slower. On what I I typically will just coat the whole interior real easily, just because it's not that much, and then I will just coat the end grain on the outside. And if you put too much on, it's not that big a deal. It'll just take a little longer to dry. From there, just go straight into the kiln. And one of the things I like about doing this anchor seal is because it is mainly wax and glue, you can just drop it in and you don't really have to worry about letting it dry. It's not going to mix into the 
uh, bark inclusions or rims or anything like that. It'll just sit there and just let it leave it on its side. Now finish drying a bowl, there are a couple of different ways you can go there. You can kiln dry it or you can air dry it. Now in a, an ideal situation, some I mean if I were doing this as my sole living, making bowls and this, these kind of containers, I would have five or six hundred roughed out bowls on my drying shelf drying at all times. That way if I was going to market, I could go through, look at my current inventory, and decide, hey, I'm kind of running low on cherry bowls, running low on pecan or mesquite, or a specific style. And I could go up to those drying racks and turn what I needed. And by having them roughed out and only using what I need, well, they could dry for six months, a year, five, ten years. In fact, I could probably have all those drying and when I'm an old man at 70 or 80 years old and I just don't want to go out and cut down trees anymore, I could spend three or four years just turning down my old inventory. Wouldn't that be nice? But we live in the real world and sometimes you just need to dry your uh, the blank, bowl blanks a little bit quicker than air drying, which can take years in some situations. In such situations, you can build a fairly inexpensive kiln. I built this one in a video that you can look up on my channel. And basically, it's just an, a broken freezer. I have a hole up front that I can plug up to increase the temperature or not. And I have air intakes on below. And inside, I've got a 60, 80, or 100 watt light bulb. Fairly simple. And this will dry my bowls in about a month, maybe six weeks. Now these kind of kilns work by convection. The cool air comes down below, it gets heated up, and it rises up. Because it's cool air coming in, the heat dissipates a lot of that moisture so it can absorb up a lot of moisture as it rises up. So it tends to be drier towards the bottom. So occasionally what you do is you start out stacking your stuff up high, and then as it dries, you lower it down and you put the dry stuff on bottom. If I'm putting like box blanks or something like here, really thick stuff that I want to dry for years, I might stick them in the door or slide them down here and just leave them and forget about them until about a week or two before I want to use them and then I'll pull them out and just let them kind of acclimate to my shop. But what I've got right here are some of my, some of my finished green bowls with their natural edges and I stick them in here for about a week or until I go to the market. I'll pull them out, I'll do one last light sanding, and then I'll put oil and wax on them. And if you remember, I did oil these before I put them in here in order to slow that drying process down. And you can see how much they warp over just a few days. Then in here, I've got them stacked up. Now, I don't know if this is just a wives' tale, but it kind of makes sense to me. You want to stack your bowls with a scoop going down. Because if you put them back up, moist air is heavier. So it will tend to accumulate in there if there's not that much air movement. Which there isn't that much in this situation. Where if you turn them down, the moisture will kind of flow down and then go back up and eventually come back out. And when you stack it, you don't want to stack one on top of the other. You want to kind of tank them over so there's air gaps everywhere so all the moisture can escape. It's a very basic setup easy to make, cheap to run, but it works. And I can get probably 40 bowls in here, which I got to go get busy and fill this thing up. Got a lot more blanks to do. Well, I hope you enjoyed this video talking about just four aspects of making bowl blanks. There's a lot more information out there, but if you're just getting into this, hopefully that can explain some of the reasons why we do things as we turn things out with the ultimate goal of getting a very balanced grain left and right and something that will dry evenly so it will warp evenly if it does warp and look good. Here's that uh, mesquite bowl I did earlier that's been in the kiln for about a week now, ready to go to market. Now if you did enjoy this video, got some information about it, you could do me a big favor, liking, favoriting, subscribing, doing all of those social medias and even more so if you want to help support us so I can buy materials to make these videos to offset the cost and time involved for video editing and stuff like that. 
visit WorthEffort.com. I run a blog, offer a lot more information, I'll probably have plans, but I also have an online store where I sell a lot of my own woodworking, some shop made tools, and I have some swag, t-shirts, hats, all with my own design, and I will have a sticker campaign coming out pretty soon. So I do hope you learned something and had a little fun, but I want you to remember one last thing. It is always worth the effort to learn, create, and share with others. Y'all be safe and have fun.